everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Lynn Lowdown. My name is Wesley Days, and I am your host for today. On today's edition of The Lynn Lowdown, we're going to be talking about Occupy Wyoma Square. It was a protest that was done on July 4th, and today we have the two people that put it together, Mr. Neil Whitridge and Mr. Anthony Coleman. Good afternoon to both of you, and how are you? Good afternoon. Great. Thank you. Perfect. So I, I wanted to first start with, you know, you guys and how did this come to be? How, how did this protest start? Um, Wyoming Square specifically? Yes. Um, like I was elaborating on earlier, we, the collective, Neil, my wife and I, we were talking about just splitting it up because initially we had done several at, uh, on the Lynn Commons and Kings Lane, Kerwin Circle area. And Wyoming Square was a spot that I wanted to hit because we wanted to, like, like I was saying, we wanted this conversation to go on just in other areas, not just West Lynn or in those, you know, concentrated areas, but moving out towards the more suburban, um, suburban-esque areas of Lynn. <clears throat> and just letting everybody know that this isn't a conversation just for Westland or the people, the residents mm -hmm. of these uh, heavily minority populated areas. Yeah, no, and, and um, in, in addition to that too, um, you know, this grew uh, from something very organic. Originally, um, Anthony, uh, spoke at a protest, the first big limb protest, and uh, he said he was going to be down there every day at 5.30. So I went down there every day at 5.30, and, you know, that developed into smaller protests in the neighborhood, um, <coughs> and eventually we decided that we were going to pursue something greater, and so uh, I'm not sure if if Anthony was able to to speak with you on this earlier, um, but we uh, we have a nonprofit pending right now called Diverse People United, and so we're, we're working in protests as well as a lot of other things um, into this this future organization. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to talk more about that too, and as well as go into uh, what happened at uh, Occupy Wyoming. Absolutely. So, you know, I, July 4th is a big day. It's Independence Day in the United States. You know, that it has such a symbolic theme to the United States and what it stands for. Talk to me about why you guys chose that date for your protest. Um, first and foremost, um, July 4th represents the United States um, independence, but the brothers and sisters that were enslaved in this country were not celebrating. They were toiling in the fields and doing other menial jobs or whatever was they were told to do and dictated to do. So th this didn't represent any form of independence for us. We've been under the misconception or, you know, via Stockholm syndrome, we've been, uh, we've adapted or adopted this um, so-called Independence Day as ours when in actuality it isn't. <coughs> Absolutely. And also, um, you know, we knew that or, or we had hoped that we would get greater uh, reception by choosing such a date as well. You know, people are leaving the city or entering the city um, just, you know, just in regards to logistics, um, you know, and trying to go, you know, celebrate um, with their family and families. Um, but what better way to exercise so such so-called independence than having a protest on the day that, you know, America, you know, declared its quote unquote freedom. Um, so, you know, in protesting such, so, you know, uh, people can light fireworks and, and whatever, but that doesn't really represent actual independence or, or inherently have anything to do with independence, but you know, that's just my person. <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, speaking about your turnout, you almost had 200 people at your event yes. um, that were protesting and standing with you in solidarity. And I wanted to ask, 
how did it feel for both of you guys? You know, you were putting this on, you had worked on it to make sure that it was something that could be put on in the community. How did it feel to have such a large group of people stand with you during this protest? Honestly, for, honestly, it was like the best feeling in the world because mm -hmm. prior to this event, we had planned a couple and anticipated larger crowds. And at the end of the day, I'm a firm believer, everybody's supposed to be where they are on that specific time and day. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? No such thing. And so with the efforts that we put forth and just having a better understanding, because like Neil said, this whole, our, our organization develop organically. It's all natural, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and just the natural momentum that we've been gaining. And I think it also is a testament to the consistency that we showed. Like, you know, this isn't a flash in a pan type of deal or just a trending moment that this is something that we are taking sincerely and honestly putting forth a million percent of our efforts because like we work hard, but behind the scenes, look at Neil, look at my wife, the extra things that the intangible things that you don't put into consideration, but they all contributed to making that event what it turned out to be. <clears throat> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and just to put it in perspective, we, we threw it together in like a week. It wasn't even, you know, we didn't have much time. So for that many people to come out on such short notice was, was amazing as well. Um, you know, and as we say, you know, bigger and better every time that was our latest and that was our largest protest. So, you know, the next thing we work on, uh, will definitely be bigger. Mm, absolutely. So, you know, there are a lot of times, you know, I've had the opportunity to go to protest around um, here as well. And I think some of the biggest things that people can get are educating moments when they can learn and open their eyes to something new. And I was reading, Anthony, that your mother gave a speech and talked about um, her issues with racial injustice um, during her lifetime. How did it feel to have your mother speaking about that? And you're standing there and listening to her and, you know, understanding and, and she's also helping to educate the next generation after us. So can you, can you talk to me about that? Well, um, how did it feel? It felt awesome, of course. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But my mother's always been very outspoken. And, you know, we grew up, understand my history. My family has deep, deep roots in the city of Lynn. I mean, I have multi-generations of family members in Lynn right now. And so, like, my aunt, she's more of a grand, she was more of a grandmother than she was my aunt. And she was very committed and very active in the NAACP mm. when I was growing up. And we were coming up here from um, New York when I was a kid. <clears throat> and just having these brilliant women in my life. And so for her to be able to share that, this is something that I'm already familiar with. This is how she rolls all the time. You know what I mean? And if like, so a lot of times she'll surprise me with how much knowledge she has. And I'd be like, Ma, how come you didn't share that with She said, you never asked. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it sounds like my mother. That sounds like my mother. You never asked. That's what she <laughs> always says to me. You never asked. So I was like, okay, maybe I need to start asking more questions. <laughs> So, you know, on top of that, that's such a wonderful moment, but also for both of you, what were some other profound moments for you during this time, during that, during that March where you said, wow, I'm really, you know, the, not only are my eyes open to such, you know, the injustices and all of the things that are going on in our world, but the people that are here are also learning something too. What were some of the big moments for you during, during this protest? Neil, go ahead, jump in first. I, I'll take the second. Yeah, um, there were several moments. I mean, I'll I'll be honest. Um, originally, I was I was very frustrated uh, because I had a specific plan in place, and um, you know, I just for some reason just thought things were gonna go one way, and we didn't. Well, I didn't 
want there to be as big a uh, police presence as there was. You know, they blocked off, uh, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile of in the every direction of Wyoming Square. I was hoping we would have uh, some people kind of driving in the vicinity at least to hear and see what we were doing. Um, but you know, that then as we, you know, Anthony spoke and others spoke when we were uh, occupying uh, Wyoma. And, you know, I was just looking around and everybody was, was paying attention, was energized to be there. And at the end of the day, you know, we, we did what we said we would do um, and, and people were empowered by it. You know, we had people who didn't plan on speaking coming up to speak, um, which for me is awesome, you know, because someone feels the power to get to lend their voice uh, to others. Um, and that's really what the protesting is about, em empowering others to, you know, act and also harnessing that energy to create further change. Um, and then even, you know, I would say afterwards, um, you know, we received several messages about people um, opening up, you know, their perspectives and, and minds to a lot of what was said and done. Um, so, you know, that, that for me, that was, that was it. Two, two moments that stand out the most to me was when I was honored and blessed to be able to recite part of Frederick Douglass's speech in reference to the 4th of July. Mm. That in itself was like- That was powerful. That, was, that powerful. was for me more like an anchoring moment because like my, my verbal commitment has been consistent, but mm. just to feel that spirit and that energy because we're honestly, Frederick, Doug Frederick Douglass's speech is 35 pages long. So like, when I first right. see the document itself, I was like, man, what the heck? <laughs> 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 but then um, when I got the, the abbreviated version of it and was able to articulate and share that with people and certain um, PowerPoints in that speech, mm. I was able to drive home and like I said, it, this is something that has touched my spirit and this is something that I've explained from the beginning. It's, I read, a, um, I read a, uh, a slogan just the other day and it best articulates where I'm at right now. It said, I wanted to be quiet but my ancestors won't let me. And so that in itself helps me to articulate where I'm at and how I feel in reference to scenarios like this. And the most poignant out of the whole day was when we were all sitting down on the ground in a circle. We had shut Wyoming Square down and we sat there for the eight minutes and 46 seconds. And there was not a peep, not a sound. I got chills sitting there and just acknowledging the fact that Nobody was making noise. Not even the pedestrians that were standing around watching us that weren't active participants in the march, but they just wanted to see what the black folks was doing. Mm. You know what I mean? Right, right, or, right, right. Or the, or the Black Lives Matters people, because I can't say black folks, because it was a, a huge, beautiful collage of everybody. Mm. So, but they wanted to see what these the black the um, Black Lives Matters movement people were doing and up to and if they were going to tear up their shops and all of this. But because we were respectful and we can we conducted ourselves accordingly, we came there to to send a message that this applies to everybody, no matter what part of town you live in. But at the same time, we are able to articulate ourselves and express ourselves in a way so that it's, it's not destructive or counterproductive to the message that we're trying to bring forth and that we're trying to generate continuous momentum for. Absolutely. If, I, so, if I could just, sorry, just add one oh, last thing. Sorry about that. Um, when we were marching back, we decided to uh, switch our route up and because, you know, the 
the police had blocked off a certain section for us. You know, and the whole point of this protest was to exhibit civil disobedience, you know, mm -hmm. not to, you know, get streets blocked off and march and be allowed to do something. You know, the point was to, we're going to do this and we're going to be heard doing it. So we switched it up at the end and we walked through the neighborhoods a little bit. And, you know, that was probably the most powerful for me because I, I had a friend, um, Lucky, who, who kind of like pulled me aside and he, you know, he's like, look at, look at all these people like out on their porches and look at the children out here. Like just, just seeing what, what you guys are doing, what we're doing. Um, those are conversations that are going to be had and, and those are going to influence lives. Um, so, you know, that, that was pretty powerful in itself. And Absolutely. I, yeah. that, that's wonderful. And so, you know, I, kind of to reverse the question a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. what do you think, or what were you, what are you hopeful for that? What were the biggest takeaways for the audience or for the people who joined you on this march? What do you hope that they took away from that experience on July 4th? For me, what I hope they took away from um, first and foremost, like I said, just having that conversation, not taking away from, but adding to, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because for the people in the twos and fews that are on the sides observing us, nine times out of 10, no, let me back this up. A lot of the racism and the ignorance that has been perpetuated by family members was taught to their children by their parents and vice and so on and so forth. So this is generational. There's layers to this. And so now in 2020, when you know children of all ethnicities are intermingling and in, you know just befriending one another and not paying attention to the isms that are you know prevalent in a lot of areas. I my desire is to have the young people calling their parents out. The young people to acknowledging that, okay, listen, the old way that you used to do these things are wrong. How can you let this person or that person into our house and still hold or harbor those type of, you know, misconceptions and those isms, that ignorance, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so <clears throat> this is what I wanted to see happen. I want the door to open to conversations where the parents are called out and, you know, and to let the children know that it's okay that, you know, you don't agree with your parents, mm. you know, because like my mother said something to me just yesterday and she says, oh, well, it's a clinical fact that this, that, and the third. I said, but that doesn't make it the law. That's not the law. We can agree to disagree on a lot of things, but in this instance where we have generational build up, like they said, the layers, the uh, just skin on the onion, you know, the, the multiple layers. Right, right. Come on, it's time to start not peeling them back, but cover all of this up. Let's start on a whole new page. Let's start from a whole different perspective and let's deal with each other individually because there's good and bad and I don't care what race you're in. So like I advocate for, let's, Let's lead by example. Let our personal uh, uh, appearance and our personal interaction dictate how you deal with me and I deal with you. Mm -hmm. Not this. This shouldn't be a talking point because when you get down to the nuts and bolts, there is no difference outside of the melanin in our skins. Mm -hmm. But we, if we choose not to because it is a choice to hold on to that ignorance it's a personal choice and uh, you know so but if we choose to hold on to that then okay you're limiting it yourself as far as friendships possibilities and opportunities are concerned and that in and of itself is sad because you never know you can probably meet look Neil and I I call him my brother from another mother you know what I mean? And I mean that. I look at him like my brother and it's never gonna change. One day. That's wonderful. How about for you, Neil? Do you have anything to add to that? One of some of the biggest takeaways you hope that the supporters had 
or the people yeah. that were with you, the protesters had during that I'm march? Sorry if I was a little distracted. <laughs> no, I'm, no, no, that was wonderful. I was hanging on every word. <laughs> Uh, no, I would just uh, emphasize what Anthony said, you know, like, like I, I mentioned in the previous uh, question, some people reached out and, and, um, you know, spoke about how their, they, their minds are open or their eyes were opened a bit. Um, and then to be more specific, you know, with what Anthony said, or, or be as specific as Anthony was like, you know, I, I would hope that some people, even if and, and I'm sure there were a bunch of people who went to a 4th of July party right after that protest, you know. Mm. Um, but I, I hope they spoke out about their experience and against anybody who tried to say something, you know, off off the cuff or, you know, racist and, or, you know, and, and I hope that that's, that's kind of the, the incremental change that we've affected. Um, so... Absolutely. So, you know, another big part to your protest was the inclusion of police officers. The police officers were there blocking parts of Wyoma Square off, making sure that everything was running smoothly as you guys were protesting. Was there any response from police officers that, you know, that you've hold, held on to since the protest or anything that the police said that really, you know, that stuck with you? Um, I did chat with a couple of one was a captain one was a lieutenant but there wasn't anything really that stood out for the most part they were they they kept their distance as far as that's concerned there wasn't a lot of interaction like mm -hmm. i heard that they were balking about you know a couple of change in plans but other than that there was nothing in reference to the police um like I, as you were talking and Neil was saying something that something else that I I can appreciate and I actually love it was how many children were there. There were a lot of children in like in a couple of the uh, events that we had prior to Wyoming Square. There were parents that were voicing their concerns about you know what if this thing goes south and it turns violent and disruptive or whatever the case may be. And what I told them and reassured them of was, like I said, we've never had any issues. And this is not the direction in which we want to go because if that starts, then any type of growth or progress stops. And to let children, because my main focus is the future. I have a grandson, I have family members that are in Lynn right now, and I would like to die knowing that things are a little bit smoother, a little bit easier for my little guy when he grows up. So he doesn't have to deal with, I'm not any, I'm not under any delusion in thinking that racism is just gonna fade away into the woodwork and never reemerge re again, you know what I mean? But if we can minimize the interaction where this stupidity and ignorance is concerned, then mission accomplished. Yeah. Um... In regards to the police, I, I absolutely the same thing with Anthony. We didn't have many interactions at all. Um, I had spoken very briefly with one about just how kind of the same sentiment I, I shared earlier. You know, we were hoping uh, that there wasn't as much of a, a presence to get our point across a little bit uh, stronger. But, you know, I mean, that there wasn't any – arguing or anything going on there. Uh, it was just kind of um, honest dialogue. That's all. Perfect. So I, we, we've talked about Wyoma Square and your protest. And, you know, once again, it was really successful. Over, you know, almost 200 people came. Uh, you know, so for people who are out there trying to plan their own protest and get their own views across and make sure that their voices are heard and the people in their communities' voices are heard, what would you say that they should know, you know, in terms of logistics? What should they know? Things that they might be walking into when planning a protest. I know you guys did this in only one week, but what were some of the things that you took away from this? Like, oh, next time I do something, I know to do this rather than that. Neil? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot. I don't know, Anthony, Anthony, I don't know if you want to go. Uh, I, I can go for, <laughs> for, for a while on this one, honestly. <laughs> um, 
what what we learn collectively through trial and error, first mm -hmm. and foremost, reach out to people that have already been doing this. Mm -hmm. Try to collaborate with others because at the end of the day, this is a movement that involves and encompasses the whole world. You know what I mean? It's not just Lynn, it's not, it's not just Boston, but it's, it's, this is happening around the world. This is unprecedented times. And when this country and African Americans or black people or whatever phrase or uh, euphemism you want to call yourself, all due respect, mm -hmm. for us to work together collaborative, collaboratively and to see how many people that are like-minded that don't look like me are involved and invested and sincere and earnest. Um, it just, this is very personal for me. Mm -hmm. Work, working together, the collaborative. Work with people that have already started organizations or have already done a couple of events so that they can help you navigate through. And the most important part is the numbers, strength in numbers. And so if a couple of different organizations or a couple of different groups get together, you're more likely to have a larger presence than you would, you know, especially in the beginning. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that I would say, you know, given that we, we did it in a week because we decided like, you know, we got to do July 4th, let's make it happen. Uh, given that we had a week, I think we, we did a phenomenal job. Um, what we could have done better, it had we, you know, had more time. Um, basically, we um, had something to follow up with at the end of the protest, you know. Um, so, so what we could have had was, um, you know, some pamphlets for people, for links and pages to follow to take that with them um, with, you know, also like a, a follow-up event, um, you know, to keep that support and energy going towards the next one. So for anybody that does have a, a protest or is planning one, that's important to have someone or, or another event to look forward to. Um, you know, communication is incredibly important. Uh, so, Marketing is very important, and I've, I think um, one of the um, feelings I've shared about this is um, it's good to promote, obviously, as much as possible, but you don't want to do so too far ahead of the actual event because it, it's important to get, get people kind of caught in the moment and, you know, ready to act immediately. Uh, you know, because if you promote the protest like a couple weeks ahead of time, you know, it's like, rah, rah, okay. And then a week goes by, week and a half goes by, and you almost forget about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I mean, I could, I could keep going, but any, anybody can, can hit me up for any <laughs> protest advice, Anthony as well. Um, we learned quite a lot. You said something, you know, just a moment ago about communication, and I know that we're living in a – tech world now everything is online everything is done by social media so how important was it for you to spread the word using social media was social media kind of a key component for you guys during this protest absolutely social media but also the physical presence because like i think it was the day before or two days before we were down market basket in west lynn and we passed out over 400 flyers personally wow and yeah. so you know um, it's like you said, it's trial and error, but one thing I would suggest, don't try to shoulder all of the responsibility yourself because you'll burn yourself out and you know, you might miss certain key points, but this is why it's good to reach out and if not work with collaborate with, um, just get pointers from people that have been doing this, you know, for longer or more than you have or we have. And again, like Neil said, uh, with the 
limited amount of experience that we have, but we are gaining as we grow and learn because we're definitely learning on the fly. Um, any pointers that I, he, or my wife can add to, please don't be, don't hesitate to ask. Right. Absolutely. So I know that, you know, we're facing, as many people have been saying on social media, that this, you know, after George Floyd, it really brought out another pandemic in our country, the race pandemic that we're all dealing with. But on top of our race pandemic in the United States, we're also dealing with the actual COVID coronavirus pandemic as well. So having so many people come out to an event, how was it trying to keep people safe, making sure that everyone, you know, felt comfortable coming out during a global pandemic? Well, um, something, and I, I take full responsibility for, it was a little short-sighted on my part, was um, not putting into consideration other people's health concerns initially. And so I corrected myself on that because it's, it's not all about me. You know, you, we have to put others in consideration. And so we made sure that we had more than enough masks and that we emphasized uh, social distancing. And I don't know if you were actually physically there, but we actually had people line up in two rows of two and stayed arm's length apart and as we took off into the streets to maintain social distancing. It morphed into something else once we seen how many people we actually had because initially we were gonna walk on the sidewalk, but we had so many people there. It was just like practically and realistically unrealistic to have them stay on the sidewalk. And it would have been an even longer march, especially crossing streets and so on and so forth. Yeah, now, um, I think especially in Lynn, just about every protest I've been to like, I don't know, 90, 95% of people are wearing masks. Um, and then some are wearing gloves too. So all, all the proper precautions are being taken. Um, and, you know, what? we even had someone come up to us um, who had mentioned that they were immunocompromised uh, um, or immunosuppressed, um, but that they were out there and they were glad that we had taken the, the proper uh, steps to make sure everybody, you know, was, was doing their due di diligence um, during this crisis. Absolutely. So uh, a couple of final questions for you guys. The first one I was reading recently on social media, the Lynn United for Change social media page. And they're talking about a uh, protest that they're actually having tomorrow. Um, on the basis of the city budget that just came out recently. And so uh, I know that you guys are working with the city, you know, city government and you have been in contact after um, this protest. And I know that I was reading that a $22 million budget for the police had recently been passed, and which is an increase of $2 million from last year's police budget. Um, did, you, did you agree with that? How did you feel about the increase going to the police department? Well, we just left the meeting, honestly, like about an hour ago mm. We're with city officials. And it wasn't what we wanted, to be totally honest. But, <clears throat> and like I said, I understand that they had these things in the works prior to, but like we explained to them, their efforts in which to reach out to the public and make this public information is flawed and that they need to do a better job of informing the public so that they can have a voice and that they are aware of what's going on and uh so moving forward i'm cautiously optimistic because until you show me different i'm still gonna have skepticisms in reference to your sincerity and the things things along this line because like somebody had articulated earlier, the you know a lot of politicians are politicians for a reason because they can talk a good game, being honest. And so, lip service isn't going to suffice. And you know, just you know, throwing out little 
uh, uh, compliments or little trinkets or little, you know, what you think or perceive as boons, when in actuality, we're not asking for or demanding for, and demanding anything that is beyond the realm of just reality and realist, being, being realistic. But because of being in a position to call the shots or dictate policy, you get used to doing this to the exclusion of others. You know what I mean? Yes. And so it's it's a work in progress from my perspective. Um, but no, I'm not happy with the way it went. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out in the future. Yeah. Um... So I guess there's no way to know 100% for sure, um, but, but what we have come to understand is that the um, $2 million increase um, has, uh, the majority of it has to do with um, replacing salaries and uh, also something to do with the new there are, there are 18 uh, new officers just hired. Um, I believe it was the the largest class of hires in 25 years, they had said. And so it has something to do with that, you know, and um, during this meeting, we, when I say we, there it was, uh, so DPU, Diverse People United, there are other people there, it was a large coalition essentially. Um, you know, people from ECHO, the New Lynn Coalition, Lynn United for Change, North Shore Juneteenth. Uh, I think that's everybody. Uh, cycle. Or Ju cycle as well. I, sorry about that. Um, you know, we had advocated for a reduction in the budget. Um, and what we got essentially out of it wasn't entirely what we wanted, but the the mayor will have some statements coming forward soon uh, to talk about uh, commitments that, that he's made. And so it's our job now to keep the pressure on him to make sure he honors those um, commitments. Um, so we, we have a lot of other demands and, and um, actions taking place in the meantime to, um, you know, on top of this, this budget hearing, but but there will be further discussions and uh, um, greater transparency coming uh, soon. Okay. So my final question for you guys, and I know we talked about this earlier, a, a little earlier in our conversation, is you know you did this protest, but you also have other work coming as well. So besides the protest, you're working on your organization as well. And so can you talk to us, you know, about the, you know your process how you know how this came to be your organization came to be and what you want to see come from from your work well our core mission is to bring about community development and establishing a true sense of community and one thing that we've got we've got going and it's actually coming up this Wednesday is what we call our quarantine boot camp and a gentleman by the name of Russell Kimba, he's volunteered his time. He's a personal trainee, he has a gym. And what he's doing, he's volunteering his time and we all come together at uh, Red Rock. And he's instructing us and working out because health and wellness is a necessary and major component for us to continue this fight and the struggle moving forward. So building mind, body and spirit collectively and bringing people together that, you know what I mean, even in COVID, we can do, we can work out together and we can interact and, you know, intermingle in a safe and, you know, responsible manner and still take care of ourselves and to, you know, just do a better job of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, again, Diverse People United is a nonprofit pending. So what we're also working on now is essentially legitimizing it as an organization and um, you know making it an official nonprofit our mission statement essentially is uh, to create a transformative healing through cooperative community-based actions and so 
you know, the, the workout Wednesdays is one aspect of that. Um, as Anthony has always advocated for in order to carry on with this fight, you need to be healthy and, and, you know, getting, being in physical shape is, is a great part of that too. Um, so that, that's one thing that we have solidified right now. What we're also looking to do is have regular, uh, community cleanups, um, and we're looking to have support groups essentially as well for people dealing with um, racial injustice and and sort of any any kind of issues at all. We're we're not um, going to you know sh shun anyone out um, for you know grieving something differently, um, but but we are at the moment faced uh, a focus on race relations. Um, also, uh, I'm not sure what else I'm missing, but oh, we're looking to have um, sort of some free financial literacy classes. We have someone that's a real estate agent who's very interested in, in being open uh, to the community and kind of just giving some 101 lessons. Um, you know, so we, we want to attack this on all fronts and we want people to feel empowered um, wherever they are and able to act, you know, uh, accordingly and, and be able to do so together. Cause that, that's what this is, is really all about. Uh, we are diverse, we are people and we're gonna be united in this effort. Um, and you know, that's, that's what we're here to do. Well, I wanna thank you guys so much for doing this again. This is really such a wonderful conversation. Thank you to Anthony Coleman and Neil Whitworth so much. And thank you all for watching this. This has been another edition of Lynn Lowdown. I'm Wesley Days, your host, and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Thank you guys again so much for this. I really appreciate it.